Hey everyone, Clint Lee here. Well, today I will be bringing you your Bauman Daily Friday video while Ted is away from the office enjoying a little bit of time uh, on the beach this week. Uh, before we begin, uh, just a, a quick reminder, if you will look in the, my top left, your top right corner of your screen, we have a link up there. Uh, please check out that link. We put together a special offer for you. We're looking at the $16 trillion renewable energy industry uh, and highlighting a, a key technology uh, that we believe is absolutely necessary to, to make uh, th those projections that growth in renewable energy become a reality uh, and a couple different picks on, on ways to, uh, to play that. And so please check that out. Uh, now for today's video, look, I know all the, the news headlines this week, everything has been absolutely uh, laser focused on meme stocks. Uh, we, we saw a big explosion in the price of meme stocks to end last week. That's absolutely carried into this week. We now have uh, AMC offering up uh, popcorn pledges for retail investors. Uh, and there's just all sorts of volatility in these stock prices. And they have, they've captured all the headlines. So what I wanna do today uh, is to go through two very key news headlines, news events, things that have probably gone uh, under your radar uh, with all the attention on meme stocks, uh, but that have huge implications for, for what's going to happen here uh, with the stock market. And so I, I want to highlight these things because they're just they're, they're not getting any attention and we've already spent enough time on meme stocks. If you want my take, uh, watch my, my other video this week with Angela on uh, Your Money Matters where where we discuss that. Uh, but now, as, as for those two big events uh, that I've seen this week that I want to bring to your attention, and then we'll discuss uh, the implications of, of what that means uh, here going forward for the markets. Uh, and the first is what the Fed. The Fed is clearly setting the table uh, to, to start tapering or start planning on tapering. You know, we, we've heard them talk before about they're, they're not talking about talking about even ra raising interest rates. Well, now they're saying, we need to start talking about and discussing uh, our plans to taper because with, with the, the strength in the economy that we're seeing and just you know recent figures, even this week, we see uh, a report on manufacturing activity uh, staying very strong. We saw jobless claims. Uh, today, as I'm recording this, dip below 400,000 for the, the first time since the pandemic began. Uh, a big number to watch uh, will be coming out on the day this video is released on, on Friday with the uh, non-farm payrolls number last month was an unexpectedly weak print, uh, seeing some signs that, um, to, that today's number could be strong. So keep a close eye on that because that's going to be a, a big driver of the Fed's plans. But uh, regardless of all that, there have been, uh, by my count, at least five senior Federal Reserve officials uh, putting out there that they need to start talking about uh, tapering uh, their, their bond purchases. So the bond purchases, that's part of, of quantitative easing, QE, is a huge part of their stimulus program. That's where they're out buying $120 billion of government debt securities uh, each and every month. Uh, here's a quick chart of, of the Fed's balance sheet. So when they go out and they, they buy these securities, that becomes an asset on their balance sheet. So you, you track QE uh, by the size of the balance sheet. And, and this goes back a, a few years. You can see that the balance sheet has swelled uh, to eight, almost $8 trillion. So $8 trillion uh, and so that, that's why this just has absolutely uh, enormous implications on, on what happens uh, with, with interest rates, with the economy, and how that all flows through to the stock market. So I, I wanted to, to, to bring that uh, to your attention. There, there's another uh, program they announced this week that they're ending, they're, they're ending uh, and winding down their, their corporate bond uh, program. They're out buying not just government uh, debt securities, but, but corporate uh, debt securities as well. Now that program stayed small. They they only purchased about uh, $13 billion in, in total assets. Uh, under that program, once again, it was more of a, a pandemic uh, era thing that they were doing to just help calm the market. So they actually didn't even need to go out and buy that much, even though 13 billion is a big number in the grand scheme of things and relative to the size of the corporate debt market, uh, it, it's, it's not that much overall. But just the threat of them coming in uh, to, to make larger purchases was enough to, to settle the markets uh, last year uh, in the wake of the pandemic. So once again, they're, they're doing these things because they're just they're, they're setting the table to, to start these ta the, the, this tapering here of quantitative, quantitative easing because they, they don't want to repeat the mistake they made back in 2013. 2013 uh, was another QE program was, was in the works. 
And the Federal Reserve just, they fumbled the communication process. They, they took the markets by surprise uh, when they announced that they were gonna start tapering purchases and you saw a spike in interest rates. You saw a lot of volatility in stocks. So uh, it was clear that this time around, they were gonna start doing this uh, well in advance and, and here they are. You know, it, it, I'm sure it's part of a, a well-scripted message uh, that they're coordinating behind the scenes. Uh, but the very fact that they're, they're putting this out there shows that we are getting uh, closer to this day as opposed to, to farther away of when they start to taper these purchases. Now, uh, that's, that's one very key piece of news uh, that's going relatively unnoticed this week. The other uh, is some of the holdups with the infrastructure bill. So the infrastructure bill uh, is, is starting to encounter uh, some, some challenges and, and that presents uh, issues with how much stimulus we might ultimately see uh, in the economy or at least the timing of that stimulus. And that's because with the infrastructure bill, one of the ways that Democrats could move this through Congress, particularly through the Senate, is with a, a maneuver known as budget reconciliation. When they use that maneuver, that allows them to pass a bill with just a, a simple uh, majority, which they, they Democrats have the slimmest of majorities in the Senate right now. Uh, but by using the budget reconciliation process, they don't need to go across the aisle to get Republican support and grab uh, 60 votes uh, uh, on other pieces of, of legislation. There's all kinds of these arcane uh, rules in, in the Senate and how it governs these processes. And just this week, the um, person who sets these rules uh, came out with a ruling that in order to use this budget reconciliation process again, if they want to use this for the infrastructure bill, uh, it's going to need to go through uh, committees, it's going to need to go through amendment votes. In other words, it's not a, a quick thing that can come together quickly. So if Democrats cannot uh, get enough Republicans on their side uh, to pass uh, this, this round of infrastructure that they're, they're currently negotiating, then it is going to uh, push out being able to use this bu budget reconciliation process. You know, you're looking at least until the fall before anything uh, gets passed versus if they want to get something through sooner, uh, that means these negotiations need to, to continue and, and come to fruition. So either uh, a bigger package is pushed out uh, or if, if they want to, to get this out sooner, they're going to have to compromise. And you know, initially, there's about a $1 trillion gap, a $1 trillion gap between uh, where the Democrats were uh, with their bill and versus the, the Republicans counteroffer. And it looks like the Democrats keep coming closer and closer the Republicans are, so it's reducing uh, that amount of stimulus. So those are, are, are two big uh, events that have hit this week, and I want to bring that to your attention, and I want to talk about what all this could mean for the stock market. But, but first, uh, be before we link these two together, I want to talk about uh, what's been going on here recently in the uh, growth segment of the market, because as we've talked about uh, all year, you know, we we flagged sort of the, the rotation that we've seen into more of the value cyclical areas of the stock market, uh, and the big declines that we've seen uh, in many areas uh, of, of the growth market. I mean, anywhere from from you know 30 to 50 percent or more uh, retracements of uh, 2020's uh, rally that's taken place so far this year. Uh, but we're finally starting to see some signs that that these are, those areas of the markets. Uh, are gaining some traction. And as I communicated with um, and talked about with our, our Profit Switch subscribers earlier this week, there's really two things I look for to know uh, that a bottom is in place. Whether you're talking about the markets in general, or you're looking at a specific uh, a sector or industry, or a theme like growth. Uh, one thing I look for is capitulation. You know, you want to see the, the weak hands have sold, the last seller has thrown in the towel. And you want to then see some sort of confirmation that there, there's a broad-based participation uh, an upside once that bottom is in place. And so I've got a couple charts I want to show to illustrate this really quick. These come from macro charts. And first on, on the side of capitulation, you know, the, the one index uh, that we can track uh, for the growth trade uh, and, and what's going on there is with the QQQ ETF. Now, and you can use a NASDAQ overall. Now, at, at the index level, it doesn't look like there's a lot going on because these larger cap names like uh, Apple, Microsoft, and the NASDAQ kind of dominate the index. But within the index, the other members, there's, there's a lot of movement uh, underneath the hood. And so we can still use um, some stats around you know, the NASDAQ to track what's going on. And so first, uh, with this QQQ ETF, uh, I want to show uh, inflows, outflows 
uh, you know, purchases or redemptions from that ETF. These, so these are net flows uh, going all the way back uh, to about 2008. Um, the, the top panel shows the price of the ETF. The bottom panel shows those net flow numbers over the, the prior one month period. And what you can see uh, is that just recently, just in the last uh, week or two, uh, we've seen the, the second largest uh, amount of net outflows out of this ETF uh, since 2009. So that's one thing we can track to look for capitulation. You, know, you can, there's a number of things you can look at. You can look at um, you know, investor sentiment becoming too fearful, uh, but these net flows this is another way to look at what you know, investors are, are doing with their own money and they are, are fleeing this fund uh, in, a, in a very large degree as well. So that, that's one sign now, if investors are, are finally throwing in the towel, you know, from there, what you want to see, if a, if a bottom truly is in place, uh, you want to see a, a broad-based rally uh, starting to take hold. So that's the next chart on here. We're, we're starting to see, um, you know, signs of that coming to fruition here. So uh, this shows, uh, this chart shows the NASDAQ index. Uh, and what we have in, in the bottom panel is the percent of stocks with a MACD buy signal. Now, you guys watch our videos, you know, I'm a big fan of using the MACD indicator. This is one, one way we can track sort of how uh, breadth is shaping up across indexes. You know, you, you can look at things like uh, advanced decline stats, which I'm a, a big fan of. You can also look at, you know, based on any number of technical indicators, what percent of stocks are triggering a buy signal. And so that's what this is tracking. You can see that this is starting to, uh, to reach above uh, that key 30 percent threshold um, that's the highest level since the pandemic lows of last year and if you look back historically um, you know these kind of line up with the the price chart uh, on these spikes you can see a lot of times this is marked uh, a key turning point a bottoming process in the nasdaq index so uh, just a, a couple things i want to highlight there uh, with the growth trade and now we'll bring it back to you know, why do these, why does the Fed, why does the infrastructure package, what does this have to do uh, with what we're seeing in growth stocks or the markets overall? And that has to do with interest rates. Interest rates uh, are the X factor here. Interest rates are a big explanation of, of what we've seen so far uh, with the markets this year, the, this rally that we've seen in cyclical areas of the stock market because we've had a, a big backup in yields. We've had the 10 year yield. Uh, moving much higher throughout the year. Uh, that's done a couple things. That's steep in the yield curve. Um, that helps uh, industries like banks. The fact that rates are going up is, is reflective of the growth outlook. That helps you know, cyclical and, and commodity type uh, areas of the markets. And then interest rates also have a, a valuation impact. You know, it's, a, it's a competition for, for capital. Capital is going to go to where it can earn the best return. Uh, stocks are expensive and yields are moving higher so you're seeing that uh, that combination draw money out of stocks uh, and, and into fixed income so what does what does the fed tapering uh, what does infrastructure have to do with all this well for the infrastructure bill just the the fact that you could see uh, some of this stimulus uh, get pushed out or get pared back that impacts the growth outlook um, you know, for, for the economy, that's going to be reflected in interest rates. Uh, now, the really big one is on the tapering side. Now, you might think, you know, instinctively or intuitively that uh, tapering, uh, if the Fed's not going to be all of a sudden start scaling back how much in bonds that they're going to buy, that's going to put downward pressure on bond prices and upward pressure on interest rates. That is not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, it, it, just because QE goes away doesn't mean you get this uh, inevitable spike in interest rates. And I got a chart to just to illustrate this point. So I'm going to show the same uh, chart on here with the Fed's uh, balance sheet assets. I'm going to overlay it now with uh, with the 10 year Treasury yield, the, the red line on here. And this is this goes back several years to about 2016. And what I want to highlight. Uh, please don't make fun of my arrows I, I hand drew on here. But these, if you look back to sort of the, the 20, um, it was about the 2018, 2019 timeframe, uh, the last time that we were seeing the, the Fed's balance sheet assets decline, um, so there, 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 was, there was tapering, there, there wasn't purchases act at all actually, and, and they were allowing uh, debt maturities to roll off. So their, their balance sheet was shrinking, but at the same time, uh, you had the, the red line 10 year treasury yields falling. So yields were falling. Uh, at a time when the Fed's balance sheet was shrinking, and then vice versa, just uh, over about the last year or so, 
uh, you can see is that the Fed's balance sheet was, was growing from about $7 trillion uh, to $8 trillion on the right-hand side of this chart. That coincided uh, with this rise in yields that we've seen. And so I, I think what a lot of it comes back to is interest rates reflecting the growth outlook for the economy. And if there's going to start to be some hangups with the infrastructure bill, uh, but then uh, you know, in, uh, an even bigger impact is with Fed, Fed tapering, Fed starting to take their punch bowl away, and what that means for the growth outlook, uh, look at how these things could impact interest rates. If, if, if we start to rein in, if economists start to rein in, investors start to rein in, uh, their growth expectations, uh, you could actually see some downward pressure on rates. And so uh, let's just take a look at where interest rates are today. So this is the 10-year uh, Treasury yield. I took this back about a year or so, and this is the key range to watch. This is We've been in sort of this this one and a half percent to 1.75 percent range uh, on the 10-year going back uh, to about March. So, you know, we've spent the last three months or so uh, trading inside this range. And just the, the fact that rates have, have been stable here uh, has allowed the, the markets to, to stabilize. We've seen the growth trade once again start to come back and work a little bit. Uh, what you want what you want to see going forward or what to watch for going forward if if once again, these, these things like tapering and infrastructure, um, if growth expectations start to, to come down a little bit, uh, and that's reflected with, with falling yields, look, pay attention to if yields start to fall through the bottom of this trading range, so falling year, yields, higher bond prices, that would be very supportive of the stock market in general, but especially uh, the growth area as well. Uh, on the flip side, vice versa, if you start to see uh, for whatever combination of reasons, yields climbing uh, above the high end of this range, uh, expect to see a lot more volatility in stocks. It's going to put valuation pressure on the stock market overall because, as, as we talked about, as Ted's highlighted, Ted's highlighted a number of times, uh, stocks are expensive right here. Uh, and if we start to climb out of the top end of this range, that's going to present more issues for the stock market. Uh, but it's also going to help uh, continue the, the rotation into more of these cyclical value areas uh, of the stock market. Uh, so that's what I wanted to highlight uh, for you here today. Uh, just look at some of these uh, very significant news events that have, that have come across uh, this week, uh, some of the, the implications that might seem a little bit counterintuitive in terms of how it could impact interest rates uh, and then the fall through impact uh, to monitor for, for the stock market. This is Clint Lee, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching.